Hi, greetings fellow horror fans. Well, our look at the Friday the 13th franchise continues on with Friday the 13th Part 2. So, here we go. Two months after the murders at Camp Crystal Lake, sole survivor Alice Hardy is recovering from her traumatic experience. In her apartment, when Alice opens the refrigerator to get her cat some food, she finds the severed head of Pamela Voorhees in her refrigerator and is murdered by an unknown assailant with an ice pick to her temple. Well, that's interesting. Five years later, camp counselor Paul Holt hosts a counseling hosts a counselor training camp near Camp Crystal Lake. The camp is attended by Sandra, her boyfriend Jeff, troublemaker Scott, tomboy Terry, wheelchair-bound Mark, sweet-natured Vicky, jokester Ted, and Paul's assistant Ginny Field, as well as many other trainees. Around the campfire that night, Paul tells the counselors about the legend of Jason Voorhees, about who survived his drowning, grew up living in the woods, and is now seeking to kill any intruders to avenge his mother's death. As Ted appears with a mask and a spear, Paul reassures everyone that Jason is dead and that Camp Crystal Lake is off limits. That night, Crazy Ralph wanders onto the property to warn the group who has garroted from behind a tree. Aww. Bye bye, Crazy Ralph. We'll miss you. The following day, Jeff and Sandra sneak off to Camp Crystal Lake and find a carcass before getting caught by Deputy Winslow and return to the camp. Later, Winslow spots someone masked in a burlap sack running across the road and chases him into the woods and to a shack before he's killed with a hammer claw. Ugh. Back at camp, Paul offers the others one last night in the town before the training begins. Six days behind, including Jeff and Sandra, who are forced to stay as punishment for sneaking off. At the bar, Jenny muses that if Jason were still alive and had witnessed his mother's death, it may, have left a, it may have left him with no distinction between life and death, or right and wrong. Paul dismisses the idea, proclaiming that Jason is nothing but an urban legend. Meanwhile, the assailant appears at the camp and kills the counselors, one by one. Scott has his throat slit with a machete while caught in a rope trap, and Terry is killed off screen upon finding his dead body. Mark gets the machete slammed into his face and falls down a flight of stairs. The killer then moves upstairs and impales Jeff and Sandra with a spear as they have sex, and then stabs Vicky with a kitchen knife. Ugh. Later, Jeannie and Paul return to find the place in disarray. In the dark, the killer ambushes Paul and continues to chase Ginny throughout the camp and into the woods. Where she comes across the shack. After barricading herself inside, she finds an altar with Pamela Voorhees' head on it, surrounded by a pile of bodies. Realizing that Jason Voorhees is the killer, Ginny puts on Pamela's sweater and tries to psychologically convince Jason that she is his mother. The ruse fails when he spots his mother's head on the altar and attacks Ginny. Paul appears and attacks Jason, but he is quickly overwhelmed. Just as Jason is about to kill Paul with a pickaxe, Ginny picks up the machete and slams it down into Jason's shoulder, seemingly killing him. Yeah, emphasis on the word seemingly there. Paul and Ginny return to the cabin. They think that Jason has followed them, but when they open the door, they are greeted by Terry's dog, Muffin. <clears throat> Suddenly, an MS Jason bursts through the window from behind and grabs Ginny. She then awakens, being loaded into an ambulance. She calls out for Paul, who is nowhere to be seen. His fate left ambiguous. <clears throat> Back at the shack, Pelivori's head remains on the altar as Jason is nowhere to be seen. Dun dun dun! So hey, let's look at the production of this movie beginning with development. Following the success of Friday the 13th in 1980, Paramount Pictures began plans to make a sequel. First acquiring the worldwide distribution rights, Frank Mancuso Sr. stated, quote, We wanted it to be an event where teenagers would flock to the theaters on that Friday night to see the latest episode. The initial ideas for a sequel involved the Friday the 13th title being used for a series of films, at least once a year, that would not have direct continuity with one another but be a separate, scary movie of their own right. Phil Scuderi, one of the three owners of Escar Theaters, along with Steve Munizian and Bob Bar's man, sorry if I butchered that pronunciation, who produced the original film, insisted, the insisted that the sequel have Jason Voorhees, Pamela's son, 
even though his appearance in the original film was only meant to be a joke. Steve Miner, associate producer of the first film, believed in the idea and would go on to direct the first two sequels, after Cunningham opted not to return to the director's chair. Miner would use many of the same crew members from the first film while working on the sequels. Cunningham, mixed, Cunningham had mixed feelings about the entire Friday the 13th Enterprise that he outlined for film critic and author Stephen Hunter in an interview <coughs> for a book Hunter wrote on violent films. I understand that Cunningham wasn't particularly proud of his work on these films. And Cunningham bluntly stated, <coughs> bluntly said that the only thing that seemed to reach a teenage audience <coughs> at that time period involved high levels of gore and graphic violence. Yeah. Anyway, on to casting. Adrian King was pursued by an obsessed fan after the success of the original Friday the 13th and, purpose and purportedly wished her world to be as small as possible. Though when the documentary Crystal Lake Memories, The Complete History of Friday the 13th, it was seen that King's agent had asked for a higher salary, which the studio could not afford. The film's heroine, Ginny, is played by Amy Steele, who won the part of the audition. <clears throat> Quote, At the time of making the film, it was before the genre really picked up, so I didn't give it a lot of credit or take it seriously. For me, it was just another audition because I had no idea that what it would end up meaning after all this time. When I played Ginny, I was really young and different from a lot of the people working at the time, so that came out of my character. I was naturally suspicious of cocky guys at that age, and you see a lot of that when I'm on screen with Paul. So I tried to put much behind the actual words in the scripts, just so she felt almost unreachable to Paul and to audiences. I wanted her to have some power. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Actor Warrington Gillette played Jason of Mass at the end of the film. Stuntman Steve Desquace, also known as Steve Dash, was credited as Jason's stunt double, but played the mass Jason throughout the rest of the film. Hmm. Now on to filming. Principal photography took place from October 3rd and finished in November 1980, and primarily occurred in New Preston and Kent, Connecticut. Special effects artist Tom Savini was asked to work on the film, but declined because he was already working on another project, Midnight. In addition, he was not receptive to the concept of Jason as the killer in the film. <coughs> Savini was then replaced by Stan Winston. Winston, however, had a scheduling conflict and had to drop out of the project. The makeup effects were ultimately handled by Carl Fullerton. Fullerton signed the look for the adult Jason Voorhees and went with long red hair and a beard <coughs> while following the facial deformities established in the original film and the makeup designed by Tom Savini for Jason as a child. Fullerton's look for the adult Jason was abandoned in the sequel, Friday the 13th, Part 3, despite the fact that the film took place the following day and was filmed by the same director, Steve Miner. Some fans have theorized that the sequence showing Jason with a beard and long hair reflects a dream rather than a reality because the following sequel picks up with the events showing, have, showing his face <coughs> not ha show his face having not happened and therefore what, were what was represented was Ginny's guess of what he looked like under the burlap sack rather than what he actually looked like which would excuse the break in continuity. Yeah. Steve Desquais, again, is how I butchered that pronunciation, was rushed to the emergency room during filming after Amy Steele cut his hand with a machete. Steele explained, quote, The timing was wrong, and he didn't turn his pickaxe properly, and the machete hit his finger. Ugh. Desquais received 13 stitches on his middle finger. During the subsequent shoot, Desquais was forced to wear a piece of rubber over his finger, and both he and Steele insisted on reshooting this scene. During one take of Alice being killed by the Jason, the, pick, the ice pick prop didn't retract, injuring King. Ugh. It was he where Desquise was wearing the burlap flower sack. Part of the flower sack was flapping at his eye, so the crew used tape inside the eye, inside the eye area to prevent it from flapping. Desquise received rug burns around his eye from the tape and had, from wearing the burlap flower flower sack material for hours. The use of the sack could was similar to the 1976 film The Town That Dreaded Sundown. Seymour Steele's character gets grabbed from behind by an unmasked Jason in the climax took three takes to shoot it right. Steele was tense and frightened during the filming of the scene. Rumor
rumors about the Joe Fury left before the, before the film wrapped, as his character does not appear in, in the end. In truth, his character was not intended to have appeared. Huh. And now on to post-production. Like its predecessor, Friday the 13th Part 2 had difficulty receiving an R rating from the Motion Picture Association of America. Upon reviewing the film, that the classification and rating administration were in Paul Hager, an executive paramount, that the, quote, accumulation of violence throughout the film may still lead to an X rating even if substantial cuts are made. A total of 48 seconds had to be cut from the film in order to avoid an X rating. This film received an, a deluxe DVD release in 2009, but the edited footage was not included. Most noted by the censors was the murder of Jeff and Sandra, who were impaled by a spear while having sex in a bed, a scene many have compared to a scene in Mario Bava's A Day of Blood, which the censors found particularly graphic. After Paramount discovered actress Marta Kober was underage, the scene showing her with full parental nudity was completely deleted. Originally, the film was supposed to end with Mrs. Maurice's head opening her eyes and smiling toward the camera. However, Minor removed the scene out of the final film as he never seriously considered it for the film's actual ending. To this day, the footage of this alternate ending has yet to be released. Ah, uh, come on! Uh, well, anyway, now let's look at the music. In 1982, Grandma Vision Records released an LP album of selected pieces of Harry Potter Virginia scores from the first three Friday the 13th films. On January 13, 2012, La La Land Records released a limited edition 6 CD box set containing Matt Virginia scores from the first six films. It was sold out in less than 24 hours. Waxman Records released the Harry Matt Virginia composed score on vinyl in summer 2015. I know the fact that the vinyl's making it come back. <laughs> And finally, the novelization. The novelization based on the screenplay of Ron Kurtz was published in 1988. Friday the 13th, Part 2, novelization. Hmm, that's interesting. I gotta like it how some films get novelizations, but others don't. But, eh, what you gonna do? So overall, as a follow-up to the original Friday the 13th, this one actually is pretty darn good. And while it's not my favorite entry in the franchise, it still holds up pretty well after all these years. So overall, I give... Friday the 13th Part 2, 4 Jack-O-Lanterns out of 5. Well, tune in tomorrow as we take a look at Friday the 13th Part 3. So, until then...